Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Nico. I'm an alcoholic. I'm super grateful to be here. I've never been to an Oakland meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, so thanks for having me. Um, My sobriety date is March 26, 2016, so I just celebrated six months. Thank you. Um, I have a sponsor, and I go to about eight or nine meetings a week, and I always sit in the front row and raise my hand and share. And um, I have four commitments, and I do all of that not just because my sponsor tells me to, but because this program has transformed my life in ways that I never even thought were possible for someone like me. Um, So what it was like, uh, I picked up my first drink when I was 14. Maybe I was 13, but I was somewhere around there. And um, by 15, I was getting arrested at the school dance um, for being drunk. And I came to, and I had a breathalyzer in my mouth, and there were cops, and I really had no idea what was going on. Um, and for any normal person, standing in front of your entire school and getting arrested would be really, really humiliating. But um, I'm an alcoholic, so even though I cried and like played the like poor me, I'm in trouble part, I actually felt really, really cool and really powerful. And I was like, yeah, I'm badass. Like, look at me. Like, everyone knows I'm in trouble. Um, and I totally denied that I was drunk. My mom was driving me home, and I can just remember being like, Mom, I'm not drunk, I swear. So if my mom's listening to this, I was drunk, and I'm sorry. Um, so uh, what I was like, I was what everyone would call, like, that girl. I was the girl falling off bar stools, puking in cabs, getting kicked out of the club, um, waking up in places that I didn't recognize, the people I didn't recognize, and... Um, I got myself into a lot of trouble from drinking and, you know, waking up with phantom injuries or waking up in my house and thinking someone had ransacked it, but really it was just me when I was drunk. Um, But through all that, I never knew that I was an alcoholic. Like, the thought never even struck my mind. I thought I just, you know, had a little too much fun. So um, I continued to drink and use drugs that way through high school, college, grad school, and um, like the book tells us, it didn't get any better. It only got worse. It's progressive illness. Um, So it got pretty bad, and um, last November, I got a call that my dad was dying, and my dad was the real alcoholic in the family. Um, He was in and out of jail, homeless, sleeping under a bridge, never really heard from him much. But I found out that he was in the ICU, and he was dying, and his doctor told me Um, You know, he had hep C and his liver was failing and he said, you know, his liver wasn't able to process toxins and he got too much ammonia from his brain and he was never going to wake up again. And what should they do with him? Um, And that was like, whoa, I remember thinking like, thank God I'm not an alcoholic, which um, is funny now, but it's kind of horrible at the time. Um, so when I got the call that my dad passed away, I was myself in a blackout lying in bed part cause I'd been partying the night before. Um, and it was really sad. He died penniless and there was no service for him because no one in my family really cared to them. He'd already been dead for so long, um, that it, it didn't really seem fitting. So that was a wake up call for me, but I definitely did, did not get sober, right away. Um, I continued to drink and use and, um, but it was different. Every time I would drink, I would think about my dad and I would see his face and I would hear like his last words to me, which were, I want to kill myself. Um, and it's like, once you look in the mirror, you can't unsee your reflection. So it, it was really different after that. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't have fun with it anymore. And, um, The last night that I drank was really, really bad. And I'm sure you guys can imagine, like, you know, how bad it got for all of us. And I just remember when I came to the next morning thinking, like, I don't want to die. And, like, this disease definitely kills. I mean, we've all lost people to this disease. And um, I've lost a lot of friends and and my father, and he was only 56. So um, I remember thinking, like, 
wow, I never cared if I died like my whole life, but I was really scared to live. And on this day, I realized like I was scared to die and I, I couldn't imagine living like a single one more day the way that I felt. Um, and so I got sober and I white knuckled it for about three months. Um, and, uh, by the grace of God, um, a friend in AA came into my life. It was my first sober friend. I didn't know that was a thing at all. I thought that was like just a word. I had no idea that people my age that liked the same music as me and were into having fun could be sober. So I went to my first AA meeting and, uh, I thought everyone was kooky as fuck. I thought it was so weird that everyone was smiling and laughing and hugging each other. And, but I was curious. I was, I was curious enough that I kept going to meetings because I saw the light in your eyes and I saw how at ease you were and the joy that you were carrying. And, and I thought you guys were faking it, but even if you were faking it, I knew that I wanted that too. So, um, I had trouble at first cause I didn't want to get a sponsor. And then when I got one, she was like, you're going to do 90 and 90. And I thought, I don't have time for that. Like <laughs> I need to sit in my room and think about myself and think about everyone I'm angry at. Um, so I fired her, like I never talked to her again. Um, but so I started to try to go through the steps myself. I thought, you know, like I'm smart. I went through grad school, like I can do this. And um, step one, I was like, all right, I'm definitely powerless over alcohol. I'm definitely powerless over everything. My life is completely unmanageable. My friends are just flavors of the week until they get sick of me. And so I was like, all right, step one, cool, I got it. And then I got to step two, and that con- that one kind of threw me off a bit. I was like, restore me to sanity. I can't remember a single point in my life that I felt sane, even as a kid. So I was like, I don't know about restoring me to sanity, but... I did believe that there could be a power greater than myself. I was always a spiritual seeker. Um, And so I I was down with that. But when I got to step three, that's when I realized, like, I needed a sponsor. I had no idea what God's will meant. I thought, like, what do I just lay in bed and, like, wait for God's will to, like, propel me out of bed? Like, how do I do that? Um, So I finally, like, worked up the courage to get a sponsor. And that's when things really started to change for me. So if you don't have a sponsor... Um, or you, your sponsor's not working out, I really encourage you to get a new sponsor or find a sponsor. There's plenty of amazing people in this room right now. Um, so when I got to step four, that's when things really started to change for me. I couldn't wait to get to step four. Like that was like, when I first came in, I was like, I can't wait to write down my list of everyone who's wronged me. Um, and so I was thinking about God's will and I was just like, Clearly, God is the one who's ruined my life. And I came to find out that God hadn't abandoned me, that I had actually cut myself off from the sunlight of the Spirit. I was stuck in so much pain and so unwilling to let go that I couldn't see beyond how I felt on the inside. And I didn't show up for my family. I didn't show up for my friends. And I definitely didn't show up for myself. So come to find out that my disease is rooted in self-centeredness. Like, who would have thought? I had no idea I was self-centered. And once I started doing my list, I realized, like, wow, these are I've been telling myself a lot of stories my whole life that actually aren't true. Um, and I began to see, like, my part in things and how I would manipulate and control and use other people the way I used alcohol to validate myself and to make myself feel like I was lovable. Um, and so I'm still working through my fourth step and my fifth step. And... Um, I can't even tell you like how good I feel and I know I'm new in sobriety and I know like bad stuff's going to happen to me, but I know that I can handle it now because I have a program and I have a spiritual solution and I have a group of people that will always extend their hand to me. Like no matter what I do, I'll always be allowed back in this room. And for someone with abandonment issues, like that's pretty fucking cool. Um, so now I have real friends and now when bad shit happens, like I have the tools to make myself feel a little bit better and I don't have to drink over it. And, um, you know, I never got to see my dad sober and he never got to see me sober and that sucks, but I get to be sober now and I get to have the recovery that he never had. And I get to have the recovery that so many of my friends never got to achieve either. So am I, what am, how am I, how am I doing? One minute. I have one minute. So, um, to the newcomers, I really hope you keep coming back. I totally thought AA was lame And, um, 
I totally thought that I didn't need it and I could do it on my own, but man, I would have sold myself so short if I never walked into these rooms. Um, I'm 27 and they say it keeps getting better and I can't even imagine, like, I already feel like my life has transformed in so many ways. Just that I can stand here right now and be okay talking to a room of mostly strangers and, like, I feel okay and I don't have to go smoke weed or take a shot, like, that's a miracle and it's a miracle that I'm here and it's a miracle that all of you showed up here today. Um, thank you. Um, now I'll turn the meeting over to Shane and I'll give you a 10 minute and then a five minute. Okay. Switch it on. Throws everything off. <laughs> Um, where's a good place right now? Near my mouth. Higher is good, yeah. <laughs> I used to host, see Giles is part of, I used to host this, well I say host, I used to be part of this meeting, Endless Summer, <clears throat> and um, we had mics there, but you'd give them to the people and they would hold it. And they, this is how they'd be with Mike. He'd be like, so when did you come sober? I'd be like, well, I got sober and about. Uh, be like, have you never fucking seen a microphone before? Like, I, do you get, like, do you hold your phone out here when you talk to it? You fucking idiot. Like, I'd be thinking that all the time. And I'd be trying to grab it and like, like here, talk, talk, talk into the mic, God damn it. They can't hear you if you stick the mic under your armpit. Um, anyway, she wandered off. I thought that was a pretty good uh, share. Uh, you did a good job. I, it's, it was nice to hear someone. I've been kind of disgusted with people in their 20s lately, and you've, <laughs> you've, you've changed that. And I don't know if it's your I, I, I'm looking at, like, this generation, and I'm, and I'm just thinking, was did everyone hate me when I was that <laughs> old? And, um, but, like, you didn't, I didn't hate you. I remember, I, um... Because I'm looking at it like your gener, and I'm like I, the music they listen to, and they're so nice, and they're like I list like gu guys at my work are listening to like boy bands, and I'm just like what what the fuck is wrong with you guys? Why am I the badass here? And I'm like pushing fifty. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I remember like you're 27. I remember. Uh, when I was like 19, you know, it's like so many famous people, they, they all died at 27. There was this whole like Janis Joplin and a bunch of others. And I remember when I was 18, 19, or well, more 15 through 19 and knowing and having that knowledge and thinking, that seems about right. Like 27 seems like a good time to go. You know, you're almost 30 and I'm like, fuck, what's after that? Nothing, right? And uh, but you're so lucky to get sober now instead of dying. Um, because there's a, so much more after this age. In fact, is the majority of your life is after this age. You could have another 60 years. You could have 65 years of sobriety, possibly, if you don't drink and you just continue to live. And um, I'm I'm 40. I'm 20 years older than you. I'm 47 years old, and uh, I got sober when I was 32, which I think. In my the thirty two for a man is the, the twenty seven for a woman. I, I in my in it's I think it's harder on women. Um, I don't know that for sure, but it's like like I you know if, if some woman takes if somebody takes advantage of me when I'm drunk, like I was people always say, oh, I'd always be waking up with strangers. Like that was part of my favorite thing of drinking. You know? like, <laughs> Like if I woke up with a stranger, I was like, "Yeah, that night worked." Uh, I was, I was never, I never had a problem with that. I, every girl I ever hooked up with, drunk, even, you know, even the ones at the end that really got me sober. Um, <laughs> you know, even I, I, I'll admit it was I enjoyed all of them. So uh, anyway, I, uh, I don't know if I, I don't have. I don't have 40 minutes of stuff to tell you guys, so um, I, I want to appreciate your share. That was good. Um, when I was 15, and I would look at 27, and I already said that. Uh, okay, I killed time there. Um, so let's get the stats out of the way. So I, I just got that. So I was, got sober at 32. I'm 47 years old. I was born in Fresno, California. A lot of people in my family were very heavy drinkers. Um, 
my grandfather basically drank himself to death. By the time he died, he died at like 62 or something like that. He seemed like he was 100. And he had a, he was shitting in a bag, pissing in a bag. He had like one testicle, one lung. You know, he was a, just a, he was like a town drunk. And um, one of the things, well, I won't even get into it. He had this fucking weird thing with dogs. And, um, <laughs> but it, 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 if I, he would bring these stray dogs home and he would go out there and he'd tell them to sit down or something. They wouldn't do it. And he'd, he'd fucking shoot them. And, um, dead, you know, and, uh, they, he ended up going to the SPCA, hauled him in after that. Another thing he did, he was married seven times and, um, he was abusive. He hit one of his wives and, um, his wife's brothers were on the, uh, Fresno State Bulldog football team, and they went over there and they beat the shit out of my grandfather so bad that he went to the hospital. And by the time he came back, his wife was gone, all the furniture was gone. They ripped up all the fucking carpeting out of the house and took all the windows out of the window sills and unhinged the doors. So when he came back, it was just like this fucking <laughs> nothing. And um, and he, you know, and what did he do? Probably went right down to the liquor store. It's <laughs> like fucking sat on his on a cement floor with the wind blowing through and got drunk and passed out there. Cause you know, that's what alcoholics do. It doesn't matter. They don't fucking, you'd think you'd learn a lesson from that, right? Like, Oh, maybe I should do something about this. Um, but he didn't. And, uh, so my parents had me when they were very young and my mom, my dad was 21 and my mom was 18 and, uh, they were divorced by the time I was, I don't remember them ever being married. Um, and I was, and my mom raised me till I was four, and then I lived with my grandmother when I was five, and then at six years old, I, I started. Uh, I, my dad picked me up, and I lived with him, and um, he got involved with uh, this woman Leah, who had these two daughters, and so what would happen is, is they would go out, and the two daughters would babysit me, and so the very first time I ever got drunk was um I was eight years old and I got drunk on cream de menthe and um it was with them because they were getting drunk and they had a couple of guys over and and they you know it was like I could drink with they didn't really care you know they were like it's funny I was like why shouldn't they be more responsible I look back they were like 14 and 16 years old <laughs> and um and they had the uh I remember they bought the Nazareth hair of the dog record that night and we listened to the whole rest of the record kind of sucks, but I Don't Mess With The Son Of A Bitch was played like over and over and over and over again. And um, I don't know if you guys know that song. But, um, who knows? Do you know that song? <laughs> Good. Does everybody know that song? <laughs> I don't mess with a son of a bitch. I don't mess with a son of a bitch. Ow, ow. That over and over and over and over. We'd play that song. And I got drunk on cream de menthe, and then they carried me to bed. And then... Um, <laughs> You know, and then nothing really happened after that. But then when I was in sixth grade, uh, I went th through sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. I went through this period where I really, I really wanted to be Mexican. And my, because my best friend was Furman and his brothers were older. And I went through this whole, like, I wanted to be a cholo, man. There was a movie Boulevard Nights had come out. And, uh, I was totally into that, and I was like, yeah, I want to be, you know, and I and I was wearing, like, khaki pants, and I'd uh, put them up to here, and I'd slick my hair back, and I'd try to hang out with these guys, but it's funny, it, later when that movie Colors came out, the redheaded dude that's in the movie, you're, you're like, you're watching that going, huh, fuck, why is he with them? Like, <laughs> how did the redhead guy join the white fence gang? And, um, <laughs> but that's how, I, like, I was hanging out with them. I looked like the, this toe-headed cholo hanging around, and um, so, but... Those guys would, you know, with them, we started, like, smoking weed in, like, sixth, seventh, you know, eighth grade. And um, you know, we started cutting school. I was writing my own notes to, to get into school. Like, if, like, say you were my dad, you know, I would take the – if you wrote me a note to go to, to for sick to school, I, I wouldn't even bring your note. I would write my own note. And so I was already, you, you know, trying – you know, I was a little savvy at that age. And um, – so, but we were smoking weed, and we were at times breaking into houses at times, and um, making you know big wheel go karts and all this shit. And then uh, later, when I became like a, a freshman and maybe a sophomore in high school, we moved to another part of town, and uh, then I started getting involved with like 
I had two two groups of friends, and one of them were like Ivy League, going to go off. They, in fact, just both my best friends. One became a professor, and the other one became a doctor. But then my other set of friends were like these punk guys I would hang out with all the time, and um, and we would go and we would drink on this hill, and we would get wasted, and we would drag each other down the hill and listen to punk rock music on this on this radio, and um, so there was like that face. So it was like, you know, it was it was. A little bit of weed at, or uh, drinking at eight, you know, weed and drinking all through uh, junior high. And then high school, it's like now I'm starting to, to drink. And then um, – and also I would get my dad's booze. You know, it was like you'd take a little bit of vodka, a little bit of – like my dad had a liquor cabinet. And so we'd take this much of everything like that, you know, and, um, and mix that together and, and walk around with that. And so that's – and then – I remember thinking like, okay, I'm going to do, but I don't want to do drugs, you know, like somehow drugs weren't, weren't going to be my thing because I remember when I was in uh, sixth or seventh grade, they showed us this, uh, this video, this guy that took acid and he thought he was turning into an orange and he, and he, and he peels his face off like that. It's, it's like, I sometimes when I, I remember when seeing Poltergeist later and thinking, oh, they copied that from that anti-drug movie, um, where he just like peels all his face off like that. And, uh, I thought that would happen. But then I was like, ah, that's bullshit. Um, and so then I got like, went through my acid phase, like 18 to 21, where I was just like, everything was all about taking acid and drinking acid drinking acid drinking like we went skiing on acid we would go <laughs> surfing on acid we would um i remember one time or mushrooms too i remember one time we went over to santa cruz and uh and we took these mushrooms and we wait and we fucking waited you ever take drugs and they don't kick in and you're like what the fuck man like <laughs> this was i had this is like i had a whole day planned here and <laughs> <laughs> and so, anyway, we took these mushrooms, and um, they didn't. It was like an hour went by, an hour and a half went by, nothing would happen. And it, you know, you'd be like, "Is this fucking even doing? Anything? This isn't doing shit." And um, so, we get in. I get in the car. We start driving from Santa Cruz back to San Jose across Seventeen. I don't know if you guys have ever drove that, but as I'm driving along, I'm, I'm like. I'm like coming, you know, like I'm just driving, you know, and, I, and all of a sudden I'm like, "What the fuck's wrong with the steering wheel?" And uh, like the steer, like the steering wheel was just like going like this, and all of a sudden all the trees were just like, and I was just like, "Fuck!" And, uh, and I remember I, I, my friend Stoffer was with me, and I and I go, I was like. I looked over at Stoffer. I go, hey, Stoffer, are you feeling these mushrooms? And I looked over and Stoffer was fucking crying. And, uh, and I was just like, oh. And uh, somehow, I met, I'm really lucky I didn't, you know, it's like, I, mean, I feel so fortunate I never heard anybody driving. That was one of my biggest fears. And um, so we get it, we finally make it back to San Jose and, um, we hang out all day and like around, I, there's a park over there. We walked around and whatever. But, um, so, you know, I'm doing this acidy thing. And then, um, and then I had this, this girlfriend and, uh, she, uh, how much time I got here? A lot of time. Uh, I have a month. Uh, and, uh, so anyway, so I, I, I get together with this, I, I, I get this girlfriend and, um, I got us. I can see the clock. Um, I, I get this girlfriend, and um, and uh, what are you doing? All right. Thanks, thanks, Kevin. He works with electronics. Um, so I get this girlfriend, and I am. I'm not a very good boyfriend, you know. Although I'm thinking at the time, I'm like the best thing that's ever happened to her, and. But I would, with this girlfriend, I was awful. Like, I cheated on her. I would criticize her all the time. I would buy her fucking Valentine's Day gifts from 7-Eleven, which we lived across the street from. And uh, I would have her, like, exercising constantly, you know, because we were going to go on this trip. And some of my friends were there. And I was like, look, you got to just keep, let's just go to the gym. And, I, you know, it was like all about me and my pride and I had like I had to have like a girlfriend that would like would make my friends be like oh wow look who Shane fucks and um <laughs> so anyway 
And I remember one day we had an argument because I had this motorcycle and she wouldn't push it fast enough to start it. And I'm like, come on. We, like, she's like behind me and it, it, like, and, and, uh, it wouldn't start. And uh, I, have a, I have a bit of a temper sometimes. I finally got that thing started and I, I revved it up. I was all, like, I was so pissed. It took me like a half an hour to fucking start that thing. I bought, no, don't buy motorcycles for under $500 unless you know how to work. <laughs> and I just revved it up. I ran it into a retaining wall and it broke the fork off and all this shit. And um, anyway, so I got this girlfriend. <laughs> And I'm thinking she's the best thing. I'm the best thing ever happened to her. But meanwhile, I'm just fucking terrible all the time. Sometimes I don't even come home. And uh, she breaks up with me and starts dating my boss. And so there goes my job. There goes the car. There goes the apartment. Because everything was hers, right? Like, I'm the best thing ever happened to her. Meanwhile, everything is hers. The car, the, the, she, in fact, she got me the job. Like, I didn't have anything. And, uh, and so now... And now I'm just fucked, right? And so, but what I did get out of that relationship was this Costco card. And, uh, <laughs> and so I would go to Costco and I'd buy those, I'd buy big bottles of vodka and I would pour them into water bottles and whatever. And I, and I would uh, go out to nightclubs and drink because I wasn't working at the time. I was just collecting unemployment. And, uh, and I would just I would just sit in my car and cry, wondering what the fuck happened to me, and um, because no one really wanted to go out like on Tuesday and Wednesday nights, you know, you were pretty much on your own, and uh, and so um, during that time, another thing I could could say this is another trick I had was I don't know if you guys ever seen the stink perfume. It's like a gas almost, but it's like a um, it smells like rotten eggs. It's like a joke thing and you pour it in here you'll clear out the room but my i used to always drive around with that in the console like right there by my car and my plan was if a cop ever pulled me over i was just gonna fucking open that up and just dump it all over me and then I, and like when he rolls down the window i would just be like what's up you know and he'd be like just drive safe home that was like my get out of the dui plan although it never i never i never did it but i was that was the plan and uh, anyway, so girlfriend's gone. I'm living with two fucking assholes in this apartment, and and uh, and I'm going out every night. And one of the nights I go out, I I go to this rave in San Francisco. Now I'm like 23, and so I go to this rave in San Francisco. And while I'm at the rave, uh, I meet this girl. I just bought some ecstasy too, and um, now I'm in my ecstasy phase. My mid twenties are all about ecstasy, <laughs> and uh, and so I meet this girl, and I'm like, hey, well, you know, we start talking and everything. I'm like, do you want to do you want a drink? And, um, and she's like, no. And I was like, hey, you want to get some max? And she's like, no. And it was, it, anyway, it turns out that this girl was. It's, you know, when I say you want a drink, what I used to, another thing I used to do too, this is, I'm giving you if you guys go out tips. Um, I, uh, I would always keep alcohol on me and then it'd be like, hey, you want to buy you a drink? And they'd be like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> and I, that meant I was going to give you some of what I had in my, in my pocket. Um, I was, cause I wasn't fucking buying you a drink. Um, but anyway, she was like, no, no, no. I don't, like, she wouldn't do anything. And I, I was like, fuck, this chick is such a buzzkill. And uh, but it turned out that that girl was in Alcoholics Anonymous, and that was when I first became. I always knew that the Alcoholics Anonymous existed, but you know, um, for some reason, I always associated it with Dick Van Dyke for some reason. And I believe he made a movie about it in the seventies. I don't. I've never seen it, but I, that always clicked in my mind for some reason. And so. Her and I go out, ended up dating, and um, she was great, you know? Like, we went out for about a year, and Stacy always had an answer for everything. So no matter what it would happen to me, like if I lost my job or, you know, something happened with a car or whatever, she'd be like, you know, everything happens for a reason. And I'd be like, what the fuck reason is that? So I could be homeless and everything's all fucked. Like, I never got what the hell she was talking about, but she always, no matter what would go on, had these bumper sticker phrases she would just slap on everything and it would make it better and I'd be like oh yeah I guess maybe she's right and, um, and then one time I went to go pick her up just did, for if you want a drink dating someone in AA sucks um, it's a to it's just sucks because they're like no I'll have my little I'll have my cranberry juice and you're like 
come on, I want to get drunk. I mean, it's it's horrible. Like right now, when I go out and I meet girls, it's like it's I I realize what they're going through if they if they if they are drinkers because they all want to go to fucking wine country, and um, <laughs> which I'll never understand. I don't get wine tasting at all. You want to taste wine at a fucking grocery store right there? Just buy some wine and drink it. Um, but she. Uh, she would never drink, and so I got tired of that. And But one thing, I, as an outsider looking in, I, I mentioned this recently, was that I went to go pick her up one time, and she was at All Groups um, over in San Francisco on a, f- a Friday night there. And I don't know if you've ever been there, but um, there's a courtyard on the outside, and there are these uh, sliding glass, there are these big windows, so you can see, and it'd be like if this was all windows. And uh, so you can stand out in the shadows and look in and see what's going on. And then I, I went to pick her up right at the end. And what right when I got there, I could see her and I could see everyone drifting apart. And then they all linked up in a circle like that. And I was like looking in like going, oh, my God, she's like a fucking witch or something. Like, that. <laughs> like What do they do? It's really if you if you look at us from the outside, you don't know what we're doing. It, it's really fucking it's creepy. Looking. Uh, if you don't understand it and even it's just weird to all gather in a circle and hold hands to me uh, still to this day. It's kind of strange. So anyway, we break up. And um, I break up with her because I can't stand not having someone to drink with, and uh, and I go on, and then I ended up I ended up with another girlfriend, and she, and um, with her, the only time she would let me go out and drink. This is now I'm like twenty eight, twenty nine now, um, and I've been drinking this whole time. I've been drinking in San Francisco. You know, wandering through the wherever, getting beat up, getting in, uh, spinning my car out on 101, going north. Um, just all, you know, shit was happening. And it, a lot of it wasn't very good. And, but, so now it's in my, I'm, I'm in my, coming in my late 20s. I got this girlfriend. And the only time she'll let me go out and drink is if I go out with this friend of ours, this gay guy, Michael Kelfo. And um, because Michael Gelfo is like my babysitter and he's going to keep an eye on me. (laughs) And so I end up being so that's the only person I could drink with. So that's what I'm drinking with all the time now. And I end up becoming friends with him and Marty and this guy Tucker. So now it's like me and three gay dudes are like my crew. And um, and then the girlfriend and I break up. And so now I'm just hanging out like I'm like the only people I have to drink with are these three gay guys. And so I'm like in the gay scene in San Francisco, but I'm straight, which it was awesome and um it's a it's and so but gay guys in san francisco or I don't know, everywhere party like fucking vampires man like like they go for like they have all these fucking drugs and they got all this best liquor and they're going they're like i'm like what's it they're like this is ghb and we got fucking do this and do this like it's that that culture is so drug fueled and um, and that just launched me through. So now I'm doing like ecstasy, crank, GHB, coke. What I mean, whatever the fuck they had, they always had drugs. And um, so we're like just doing drugs all the fucking time, right? And uh, so now that's like the last three years of my drinking. And so now it's like 29 to 30, 31, 32, and I'm realizing like something's got to change here. Like I'm. I'm wearing myself out but I, I couldn't go on i was always miserable all the time i'd be drinking all night long um and then coming home and like one of the things i do is i like like today how it was so nice i would draw all the blinds closed and i would just sit in there and a lot of times i would watch golf and um <laughs> and i don't even fucking like golf i don't I can give a shit about golf uh but when I'm watching golf, it's, it feels like I'm doing something, you know? Like, it's like, like for me, watching golf in a dark room is like I'm outside at the park. And uh, so I would just, like, be in there all fucking hungover watching golf. It seems like golf was always on. And, uh, and so, and then around 4 o'clock in the afternoon or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I get together, order a pizza, and then it would, the whole thing would start off all over again. And when, the best thing was if I could beat... During those times, I would, I'd always try to get to sleep before. The, the worst sound was when you're trying to go to sleep. You know you're not tired, but you're like you, you just feel like an empty snail shell, and and you start hearing this sound. It's like, 
and it's the bird. You hear that fucking bird, and you know, you're like, oh, the bird. Here comes the, the, the birds are awake. That means it's tomorrow, and I fucking still haven't slept. And, uh, like, I, hate, I hated those birds. And, because then it was like, then the sun would come, and then I couldn't sleep at all, right? And I'd be like, fuck. Um, so, but I always would be like, I got to do something. And, and in the back of my mind, it would always be this thing. Whenever I'd be in trouble or something would be going on, I'd be thinking, okay, what would Stacy do? What would Stacy do? What would Stacy do? And uh, Stacy, just to give a quick thing of how well Stacy dealt with stuff, was that um, Stacy's brother used to sell Coke up in Seattle. Stacy's father got diagnosed with a terminally with terminal cancer and had like six months, a year left to live. And he got together with his son to do this big coke deal. It was a straight fucking Easy Rider meets uh, Breaking Bad story. And uh, and so they're going to sell this coke. They get busted for it. While she's up there at Christmas time, the cops come in there, pull her and her whole family out on the front yard, put them in handcuffs, strip the whole house apart. The brother goes to jail for like over a decade, and the father goes in a barn and kills himself. And through all of that... Stacy held it together more than I did when my fucking Subaru wouldn't start. You know, that was like, I was like, she was like, well, you know, God has a plan, and I'd be like, out there like, fucking start, man, and uh, like I couldn't handle shit, and I still, she's, I still think she handles like I've been sober fifteen years, and I still can't handle when the car won't start, but. Um, but it was like that was her matching calamity with serenity. I, I've never seen a bigger example of it in my personal and directly than that. And uh, so I'm like always thinking, like, what would Stacy do? What would Stacy do? I'm feeling miserable. I'm watching golf. I'm, you know, I'm like just horrible, horrible. And so I realized, oh, Stacy used to go to AA, you know. And so I decide to go to AA, and um, and I went to a couple of meetings. And I, you know, I, you know, it was like, it seemed kind of cool, but I wasn't really sure. Um, I, went, I remember going to this one meeting, Brian, who, the guy who has the girlfriend with the twins, um, mm -hmm. always brings us up. But he, like, I went to, I go to a meeting and I raised my hand. I got like a week or something. And um, I remember saying like, you guys are alcoholics, but you don't fucking drink. So you're not an alcoholic, right? Like, what does that even mean? If, you, if you're an alcoholic, you drink. So if you're not drinking, you're not an alcoholic. That is, you're like, I remember saying to the whole thing, I'm like, you guys are like a bunch of impotent porn stars going on about your fucking good old days and whatever. And you're just sitting here in these chairs. And um, they're like, well, just keep coming back. And I was like, okay, I will. And, uh, <laughs> and so I just kept coming back because I noticed, one thing I noticed, like all of a sudden it was like, when you're sober, even after like a week, you know, it's like just going to not hearing the birds. That's one thing. And then not, and then getting up and actually leaving the house and seeing a real park, not just golf on TV. And, um, and right, I'd be, I'd be walking along and I, and I, and all of a sudden I'd be like, in my neighborhood, I live in the hate and I'd walk along, I'd see a statue or something. I'd be like, when did they put this in? And they'd be like, 1884. <laughs> like, so all of a sudden I was like, it was, it was like I had moved, and, but I hadn't moved. I was living in the same place, but everything was completely fucking different as I, as I continued to stay sober. And, um, I no longer just had three gay friends. I had, not that there's anything wrong with that, but you know, it's like, I'd like to meet more people. And, um, <laughs> And all of a sudden, I was like, people would be walking by me in the, on the street, be like, hey, Shane, what's up? Like, hey, well, you know, it was like, and I was like, hey, like, all of a sudden, it was like, I knew everybody. <laughs> and I was outside, and, and, I, and I, I remember, there's a great scene in the movie Crazy Heart, where he, that country work, what's his face, plays a country singer. And I thought that was a really good, accurate portrayal of, of a bit of getting sober, where he's lying in his house, and he's looking around, and you realize what a fucking dump this place is that he lives in. And and I remember going through that, too, and all of a sudden looking around and realizing there was like, like oh, I remember where I threw that ketchup bottle against the wall there like three years ago, and there was like, this is like uh, weird stains from where I had thrown shit all over the house. Like I started recognizing them, and so like, I, I painted my house. I, I had money all of a sudden. You know how much money you fucking waste drunk? It's unbelievable. Um, even now, like a drink, it's like some, some like people are like, oh, this drink's $9. I'm like, nine fucking dollars. You got to be kidding. I'm not paying that. And, um, <laughs> but all of a sudden, I started having money. Uh, the place was fixed up. I started feeling better. Everything just seemed, you know, so then I started saying, it's just continuing to go to meetings because it, it felt 
better, you know? And, um, and then I, uh, I got my first sponsor. His name was, I don't know if you guys know Randy Kolaski, Kolaski. I don't know. I don't even know his last mm-hmm. name. Um, he was my first sponsor for a, a, the first year, you know, and, um, and that, and that was really good. And I wrote, and I, then I came up and I wrote my four step. And then I realized after writing the four step that, uh, you know, that girlfriend that I had cheated on and try, you know, just got mad because she couldn't push my bike fast enough and all this stuff. After I was done writing the four step, I had this plan my whole life was I was going to get back together with Michelle and she's thinking we're going to get married and we're going to drive out and we're going to stop in the middle of the desert. And then I'm going to take her out in the middle of nowhere to take a picture. And then I'm just going to run back to the car and leave her there. And that was my, I thought about this all the time ever since we broke up and she started dating my boss. And I like how somehow that would fix everything. Ah, you're stuck there now. You're not going to be home for hours. And, uh, like, like that would do anything, right? It's bull, what a fucking dumb plan that is. And, um, but after I did the first step. I, re- I all the stuff I told you that I did. I never even looked at that before. Before it was like that fucking bitch just can't push, and um, <laughs> or what you know, like that was in my head. Like oh, she just doesn't appreciate. You know, it's still a rose just because it's from fucking Seven Eleven doesn't mean anything, and um, like everything was like, eh. and uh, so I you know I wrote this four step, and all of a sudden I realized like oh wow, I play a part in things, and I need to adjust what I do and. And I wasn't angry with her anymore. And then I made an amends with her, and 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 um, and so like that came out. There's we're so lucky to have this thing where we take a look at ourselves. I've I've shared this in meetings before, but like my grandmother, she just died last month. Um, you know, I remember her saying one time at, we're at Christmas time, she's like, you know, you're talking about my grandfather. She said to my dad, she's like, you know, your your dad hit me, used to uh, hit me, and my dad's all. Dad never hit you. What are you talking about? And she's like, well, he threw a hanger at me one time. And he's like, when was that? And she's like, when you kids were little. And she's been fucking hanging on to that and hanging on to that. That was like probably in 1951. So this is like 2004 when she said this. So for 50 years, she's been grinding out that hanger, you know. But had she wrote a four-step, she would have come out with like, I drive everybody fucking crazy. Um, <laughs> And, my, and that house was a very small house. And if my grandfather wanted to hit her with a hanger, he would have. But he probably threw it. And she, you know, because it was, like, closer than I am to Trevor. I mean, it was, like, that, maybe the end of that yellow thing. And um, so you could easily hit some of those hangers. Um, but, you know, he didn't. He probably just threw it by her. And uh, so... You know, she's grinding that out, but it's like I would have—I'd still be pissed off at Michelle today and, and processing my my abandonment trip. But after I did the four step, now it's cool. I let it go, you know. And um, and I found it just—I just all of a sudden realized that five minutes from what? Just now. From right now. Yeah. Uh, I realize that life is just easier sober, you know. And and then I had a hard time with uh the higher like i was like oh i gotta get a higher power if I, what am i gonna do you know like how am i gonna do this and and i know i f- f- the way i've gotten around it's evolved uh, it was nothing for a long time but then i realized all of a sudden it is something and what it is is everything that's happening like the police are a fucking higher power you think you got you think you're you the number one power. Try to stop a cop. They're going to fucking hit you in the head with a club and knock you down. You can't, like, it's just, eat, and they're less likely to do that if I'm not driving drunk down the street, you know? Like, it's just, it's just not going to happen as much. The statistics of bad things happening to me are way lower when, like, how many here with over a year of sobriety got a DUI in the last year? <laughs> None? Like, what, zero? Right? Uh, uh, it's just, it's just fucking common logic. Like, you, like, you gotta, to me, it's like, I must align my will with the will of the universe, regardless of whether or not I believe in anything. Like, I have to obey the traffic laws. I have to do what's laid out in front of me. And that is just so much easier sober. Like, I'm not, you know, I'm not knocking prayer, but I don't, like, a lot of prayer to me seems like I'm sending little messages out into the world trying to alter the universe rather than it's like I'm not uh, like I need to align myself with what's happening that's it like that's that's like you know like pray for God's will it's like pray I get on the page of God's will you know like whatever's going on like I'm stuck in it there's no way out of it and um 
And that is just, like I said, easier, sober. Sober, you have your money is better, your physiology is better with yourself, your relationships are better, your work is better because you're not going in there hungover or trying to like, you know. <laughs> How, I mean, how many how many of our relatives die? We call in like, oh, my aunt died. I can't make it into work. Like I, every every time someone calls in now at work with some relative that's passed away, I'm like, they're fucking drunk. That's <laughs> like that's what I I always think that because I I did that all the time. You know, it was like everything was an excuse to get out of doing stuff. And since I've been in AA and quit drinking. Life is just so much easier, and I feel so much better. So if you're new, stick around, especially if you're over 27, and um, <laughs> because it's just it's over for you, you know. Like there's like, there's nothing left, you know. There, like like you don't want to. What, what really fucking nailed me one time when I was still drinking was Chris Rock. He said that thing where he's like. You don't want to be the old guy at the club. That fucking hit me like tabango. I was like, I was like, yeah, I know those old guys at the club. Like I see them there. They're like forty five, and they're like trying to, like, hey, what's this? And, uh, and they're they're just all fuck. They're like, you can just see that creepiness pouring out of them. You know, that's because. They don't have a, hey, you know, like, what? They? <laughs> like, they're just in there still trying to fucking do it and talking about, like, what, it, like, talking about what I'm talking about, poltergeist and colors. You don't even know what the fuck I'm talking about. And, uh, and, and so, do you know what I'm talking about? No, you don't. It's a scary movie and a movie about gangs with Sean Penn. And, uh, so, like, it's just over for you. Um, and A, it ruins your drinking, too, because, like, I'm going to tell you this. For those of you that go out, know that the next drink you, I want you to hear this voice. You're fucking up. That's it. Like, just, you, you, you can, you can hear it. Like, it's like a, a mouthful of booze and a head full of AA is, it is such a buzz kill. And, um, and that's what happened to me. And I'm glad it killed my buzz because I don't want to be the old guy at the club. So <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.